praise your name. Join me. It's all me. All right. Well, good job, you guys. Um, you're already warmed up. <laughs> Page four in those hymnals. Let's, uh, let's grab those hymnals, please. <clears throat> and let's stand. I think we often forget about that, and it's easy to get relaxed. But uh, let's give God our best. The best way you sing is standing upright. Page four. To God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Verse 2. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a bond and receive. Here we go. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, the Jesus, the Son, and King him the glory great things he had done great things he has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son by pure air and higher and great will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people 
but rejoice, O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He had done, and give Him the glory, great things He had done, and give Him the glory, great Good job. Turn just two pages. Page eight. You're like, that doesn't compute. <laughs> a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails. Our helper, he amid the blood of mortal is prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. Armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his evil. It did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the The man of God's own choosing Does as who that may be Christ Jesus it is He Lord Sabaoth His name From age to age the same And He must win the battle. Let's do verse 4. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abided. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through Him who Goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abided still, His kingdom is forever. Let's give a good big amen. Be seated, guys. Wonderful. Good crowd. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. I love looking out and seeing folks on Father's Day. You know, traditionally, uh, Father's Day <laughs> is nationally one of the least attended services of the year. And I share that every year because... At Penn Royal, we're at least, at least always at or above average. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. We buck the national average, so I, I like that, um, the national trend. I think uh, one of the reasons is not very many of us play golf, just few of us. <laughs> but those of us that do, we wait till after service. Amen? Because yep. you can golf all the time, fish. 
Uh, I, I remember, you know, before I really started following Christ, that was the thing I wanted to do was just go fishing on Father's Day. You know what I mean? And now, if I go fishing, it'll be after church. I'll tell you what I really want to do is just sit in my recliner and do nothing. Right? Anyway, good morning. We have a few announcements for you uh, before we begin. And uh, first of all, if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, in front of you, you'll find a welcome card. And we ask that you fill that out with as much information as you're comfortable with. And uh, at, you can either at the welcome here in a little bit or at the end of service, you can take it back to the welcome station, which is immediately outside the doors on the right. And give that to Kathleen or Missy or Mom, whoever's back there. They will give you a gift just for choosing to worship with us today. And uh, we want you to have that. Uh, the, the other thing we want you to have is a Bible. So if, in front, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, uh, you'll find a blue one. And it looks like this. I want to model it for you. Get my Vanna White on. Pride of North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It looks like this, right? And this is the actual one that I'll be preaching out of. So when I make page references today, it'll correspond with the blue Bible that's in your pew. If you're witnessing to somebody, you know, if you're, you've got plenty, you've got a Bible, you know, and all that, and you're telling somebody about Jesus, one of the easiest things to do is give them a Bible and turn them, dog ear the book of John for them and say, here you go, start reading. You know what I mean? Because there's good, I mean, everything you need for salvation is right here, amen? amen. Right. So we believe in God's word. We want you to have a, have a, have a copy of it. Um, I want to thank everybody who last week stayed for the, the baby sprinkle, um, and it was good time, good food, good fellowship. Uh, we, we slack a little bit off in the ooh-ah category because we were busy fellow, fellowshipping and conversating, um, had some amateurs try to take over, so we'll have to, <laughs> <Redeem>. <laughs> but anyway, it was a wonderful time, and I, I, I think everybody was blessed, and I thank you all for participating in it. Uh, big event next Saturday. Next Saturday is our, uh, we called it Pennyroyal in the Park initially. It's a community outreach event that we're doing at Franklin Commons in correspondence with um, the Warren County Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. Um, and so that is from 12 to 4 on Saturday. Um, right now, when I looked at the uh, sign-up sheet earlier, we had some gaps that we need to get filled today. So if you were intending on signing up for that, please sign up today because we need to make sure that all those spots are filled so we can go serve those people um, in, 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 a, in a, you know awesome and, and uh, cool way. Uh, so we have bouncy houses. We have uh, uh, cotton candy we're going to be handing out and popcorn, a snow cone machine. The, um, the coalition is going to be bringing some stuff to hand out and things like that. So we need all hands on deck when it comes to this. If you are planning to come the day of the event, the event is going to be held on the basketball court at Franklin Commons. Now, if you've been at Franklin Commons recently, you're like, there is no basketball court. Well, there used to be. And the pad is still there. And it's between, um, I'm trying to think which courts that, that is. Yeah, Valley Forge and the middle one. Bunker Hill's the end. Yorktown. Yeah, so Valley Forge and Yorktown. It's between Valley Forge and Yorktown, I believe. Um, so anyway, uh, and it's like back in the back. So we'll have some signs. We're going to put some signs up to lead you in the right direction. But if you're planning on working that, then we need you there just a little bit early, uh, you know, to help make sure that we got everybody that we need and all that. I also need tons of help setting up. Because um, there's just no way physically possible that I can set up bouncy houses by myself. So um, we need you here. If you want to help set up, we need you here by, uh, I would say, about 1030 on Saturday um, to help set up for that, to throw st everything in the trailer, and then we'll head over. And uh, we, I, I also need, um, I need one more truck uh, to go and pull one of the trailers with the bouncy houses back that morning we got to be there at 10 o'clock so we need to be there at 10 o'clock to pull, to pull that so if anybody can help let me know if nobody contacts me i'll be asking people uh very awkwardly and maybe even publicly and after a while so 
So anyway, I need some volunteers for that. So, um, and then on Friday, we, we have people that are gathering here starting at 6 o'clock specifically to go ahead and pop the popcorn, bag it up, put it in boxes, you know, make the cotton candy, put it in bags, put it in boxes so that we can just haul it over there <clears throat> as opposed to taking the whole machine. So um, if you can do that, that's going to happen on Friday, and uh, we need all the help that we can get, okay? Are there any questions about that event that I probably can't answer? I'm just kidding. I probably can't. Any questions about that? Yeah, come when you can. Yeah, come when you can. I'll probably add another 100 to that. Yeah, let's do 300. Um, so anyway, anybody else have any questions? Yes, Bailey, what's your question? What flavor of cotton candy? That's an important question. Um, and I'd have to defer to Jessica. She's the one that bought it. Jessica, what flavors of cotton candy do, do we have this time around? I think there was cherry. Cherry, vanilla, purple. I like grape. I don't know. Razzleberry. I don't even know what that is, but it's probably delicious. Right? And the snozberries taste like snozberry. Yes. Right? But anyway, uh, so if you have any questions about that, let me know, and I'll try to get those answered for you. On 4th of July... The parade, they have a parade downtown. It's the wettest parade in, in, the, in Ohio, they say, or the country, or whatever they say. Um, and we're going to participate in that parade. And we're going to build a float and, uh, you know, squirt people with water. I got a 400-gallon water tank that we're going to throw on the back of a trailer with a pump and uh, soak some folks that way. Um, but we need folks to walk during the parade and pass out flyers for Vacation Bible School. So if you, don't, uh, if you don't have anything to do, uh, I would invite you to come and uh, participate in that. Kids can come and they can ride their bikes, decorate their bikes, uh, that kind of thing. They have a, a, a Most Patriotic Kid Award that they give to the ones who dress up and paint their bikes. The theme for this year, I think, is like, I don't know, it's red, white, and blue something. Um, so anyway, uh, come dressed out in your patriotic gear and uh, you can come and walk in the parade. Uh, we will have a sign-up sheet for that. We don't yet. We already do. You guys are on top of things. We got a sign-up sheet for that in the back as well. So come and do that. If you can walk, you can do it. Amen? And uh, we need to represent, all right? Other churches in the area, when they show up, they'll show up, you know, 20, 30, 40 strong, you know, just walking in the parade. Well, we're going to have some people walking in the parade, and we're going to blast them with water. So it'll be a good time, okay? And there will also probably be some... Well, I don't want to give too much away. Just come and have fun. Um, we also need people, some men, to, uh, to help put the float together. Star Spangled Everything is the theme. So if you'd like to help with that, get with me. On July 5th, we have a gathering on Wednesday at 6.30, July 5th, which means on that night we won't be having Wednesday night service. I also want to thank everybody that came to Wednesday night service this week. It was a good time, I thought, very informative. And uh, it was a good time of fellowship afterwards, hanging out and just talking. Uh, so this Wednesday, 7 o'clock, come and uh, get some more God's Word and fellowship. And uh, we'll gather together and uh, all that kind of thing. Um, today's Father's Day. Woo. Amen. That, that is a woo. You guys clap for Mother's Day while we get for Father's <laughs> Day. Oh, okay. Moms get all the cool stuff. So we do have some gifts for dads that we want you to, to, to have. Um, if you're a dad, when you leave, there's a table out there with these white boxes on it. And in the white box are these beautiful cups that um, Terry and the crew put together for us. And I want to thank them for doing that. Um, but they're really nice cups. And I'm going to tell you something about these cups, too. Is uh, the other day I put some coffee in at the beginning of the day, forgot about it, set it on the stove, came back that evening, it was still warm. Nice. You know what I mean? So they work, they're good cups. So here's a gift that we want to give you guys. And there's a beautiful, uh, a little informative, it's actually a really cool little uh, bookmark for your Bible, and that's in the box. So when you open the box, don't think that that's just box trash. You know, it's in the box. I made that mistake earlier. I, like, ripped this cup out because I forgot my cup, and I just threw the box away, and I was, Missy's like, hold up, you know. So I want to thank Missy for getting those two. All right? So those are the, the gifts that, that we want to give you because 
At Penrose Baptist Church, I almost preached on this today. I was praying about it. I'm going to be honest with you. And you know how, you know, sometimes on Mother's Day I, pray, I preach about mothers and all that kind of stuff. I was going to give you a Father's Day sermon about fathers and all that kind of stuff, typical stuff. The Lord didn't lead that way today. So we're just going through um, with the next thing in the life of Jesus when it comes to the sermon. But I do, one of the scriptures that I was thinking about praying on, and I want to thank the men of this church. I want to thank the men of this church, the body of Christ, for being men of God. Amen? Amen. Because we're dying breed. You know what I mean? Christian men, fathers, staying and building families and, and all that the, that God tells us to do, we're a dying breed. And that's just the nature of the way the world is. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says this. He says that your witnesses and God also how holy and blameless our conduct was toward you believers when he was talking about the church at Thessalonica, right? So one of the things that he says is that we were holy and blameless. And then he says this. He says, for you know, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you. I wanna, I'm thankful for fathers in this church that exhort their kids. Amen? Uh, he says, and... We encouraged you, and I'm thankful for, God, for godly men in this church that not only exhort but encourage their children. I'm thankful for you guys, and I'm thankful for you godly men who, it says, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I'm thankful for godly men who charge their children and their families to walk in a man manner worthy of God and his kingdom and his glory. Amen? So at this time... What I like to do, if you're a dad, just stand up. I'm already standing, so I can't get any higher. Stand up, dads. Give them a round of applause. We thank you, and we have a little video uh, expressing the gratitude, and uh, then we'll, we'll do the welcome for two minutes. Father's Day, Dad. I miss you very much. And I love you. I miss you. But I want that church. And I love you, Sissy. I miss you very much. Happy Father's Day to every father out there. We love you all and we hope you the best of days. Happy Father's Day and I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for teaching me music. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you, Dad, for raising me to the boy slash man I've been. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. Hi, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Hey, Dad. Uh, happy Father's Day, and thank you for instilling music in my life and giving me so many opportunities to um, succeed in life and... Yeah, um, happy Father's Day, love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, I love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. I love my dad because he um, plays music at Penny Royal Church and that he always reads me a bedtime story when it's nighttime. Dad, happy Father's Day. I'm excited to give you my present that I made you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you. I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Happy Father's Day, and I love you, Dad. Father, 
Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, the hair. That's why I put the hat on for. That was cool. Yeah. Lifted high, here we go. All things bright. Put a smile on your face. And beautiful you are. All things wise. Wonderful you are. In my darkest night, brighten up the skies. The song. Yeah. 
Give him praise. So fake. 
so constant, so loving and so true, and so powerful in all you do. You feel me, you see me.
<laughs> Ashley reminded me uh, before service today that we have a bunch of these t-shirts left, and I was going to tell you about it. Um, if you'd like to purchase one for ten dollars, you can do that. Um, but anyway, it's just Penrose Baptist Church shirts. If you would like one, we do have kids sizes. Um, if you'd like one, you can get one. Um, talk to Ashley. If you don't know who Ashley is, it's my wife, and she's in the nursery. So just go in there, ask for Ashley, and you'll get that figured out. But anyway, um, at this time, kids, you guys can go downstairs. Be good. Learn about Jesus. Guys, I'd also ask you to remember uh, Kayla Hunter in your prayers. Uh, Kayla and Blake have been coming to church here for the last month or so, and uh, she's in the hospital right now, pocketering with an infection, and she's got to have a a bit of a surgery tomorrow. So I would ask you to remember her in your prayers um, this week, especially today and tomorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll get into his word. Heavenly Father, we love you, and I thank you for being the example that some of us never had when it comes to being a father. For some folks, today is a really rough day for a number of reasons. If if our fathers have come to be with you, Lord, I pray that uh, for those that are going through this Father's Day without their dad, Lord, I pray that you would just wrap them in close today. And Lord, I pray for those who had uh, negative examples, examples of what not to be when it comes to a dad. And Lord, I pray that all of us know that we are without excuse because you are a perfect father. And you've given us your word. And you tell us about how you love us and about uh, all you're willing to do for us all you were willing to do so that we would come to you and be able to have a relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for each one of the men in this room and those who couldn't be here today that are represented in this body. Lord, I, I thank you for them, the ones, the dads who, you know, in a, in a world with a declining culture, prioritize obedience to you in front of their kids and in, in front of their families. And Lord, they're under scrutiny. And uh, we can't do it without you. So, Lord, I'm thankful for them, and I'm thankful for your word this morning. I'm thankful for their families. I'm thankful for you not just leaving us here to do it on our own, but giving us your spirit. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful again for your word. And, Lord, as we get into your word, Lord, I pray that today on this Father's Day, where we honor the gift that you've given us, which is Father's, and we, and we honor the gift that you've given us, which is eternal life. Lord, I pray that you be with us during this time that we have together as we get into your word, which is all that we need, that tells us all we need for salvation and all the instruction that we need to live as godly men, godly fathers, godly parents, godly women in this culture and in this world. Shape us, Lord, into what you would have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 12 is where we'll be today. Matthew chapter 12. And we've been going through looking at, in a chronological way, at the life of our Lord and his teaching, what he's taught us. Oh, okay. It's fine. Um, so, uh, last the last time that we talked, that we got together and we talked about um, this, and last time we preached uh, about the life of our Lord, which was um, last Sunday, uh, we talked about how Jesus had established that He had authority to forgive sin, something only God has. Amen. Authority to forgive sin. And this week, he takes it another step farther, this next, this next 
these next things that happen in the life of Christ um, tell us more about who he is. And specifically, this, this, is, um, this is about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is instituted from the beginning of creation. On the seventh day, God rested, right? And so that's the day that we set aside, that we're uh, commanded by God to set aside for the purpose of honoring Him, of resting from all the troubles of life and focusing specifically on God, right? And in a fast-paced culture like ours, a Sabbath is something that can quickly uh, be thrown to the side, you know what I mean? It's so bad that, that nowadays, you know, we, we, we're like, all right, listen, if you can't take a Sabbath day, at least take some Sabbath moments. And I'm like, yeah, but he tells us to give him a whole day. You know what I mean? And I've even had questions. People say, all right, Josh, you know, on Sundays you're doing your thing and you're, you know, talking with people and preaching and all that kind of stuff. So when do you Sabbath? Well, the answer is really Sundays. Is my, that's really my Sabbath. Sometimes I try to take the day off on Monday. I say sometimes because it rarely, it, it, it rarely happens that I can take a whole day off on Monday. Like tomorrow, I have a meeting at uh, 12 o'clock with uh, the builder and the architect, you know, the things, getting things done that we need um, for the school and stuff like that. And uh, it looks like it, for us, it's going to cost about $1,200 out of our pocket um, for the architect. He's got a He's got to do some drawings that he didn't think he would have to do um, because, f unfortunately, I can't find them. Um, and I've looked everywhere. We have looked everywhere. Every filing cabinet that's here at the church has been ransacked, and we can't find them. So, anyway, we had somebody yesterday um, that heard about that said, hey, we'll give you $600, you know, toward that. So, I'm thankful for that. Amen. And, uh, you know, if, you, if it's something you want to give to, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, but, anyway... Like I said, on, rarely on Mondays do I get to take the, the whole day off. But I do, I do try to, on, on Sundays, rest, you know. And sometimes it's difficult to rest on Sundays for a pastor. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. Amen? I'm notorious for my Sunday afternoon nap, right? And when that gets infiltrated by the cares of the world or those... Uh, wonderful blessings that God has given me called children. <laughs> they are wonderful blessings. I'm just joking. Then, um, you know, I get kind of bent out of shape about it. Uh, but anyway, so what, what the, if, if, if we're legalistic about things, if we, you know, are so, you know, focused on the rules, sometimes we miss the, God's blessing, you know, that he's given us through his commands. And this is an example of that very thing, and that is... Um, the Pharisees trying to back Jesus into another corner. Listen, like Jesus is the master of these things. You know what I mean? I don't know why. Like this is the beginning of it, and they're just learning how good he is at it. But later, I mean, he, he, he's so good that they keep on trying to corner him, and he never, you know, he always has a way to, to show them what they're missing. The stories that we're going to be looking at today are found in Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapters 2 and 3, and Luke chapter 6. But we're going to focus on the one in Matthew today. Um, I, like the, I like the way it's presented, and it's just a, a preferential -ish, you know, thing. It's not you know, this over this. It's just, I like the way it reads. Okay? So we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 12. It's on page 906 in the Blue Bible. I'm going to read through... Um, the first few verses of it, and then we'll come and talk about it. It says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. In the book of Luke, it tells us that the way that they did that, they plucked the grains, and then they rubbed them in the palms of their hands, right? Because you can't eat the whole thing. you got to get rid of the chaff. So they would rub it in their hands to get rid of the chaff, blow it away, and then eat the grains, and that's what they would do. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him? How we entered the house of God and ate the bread of the, of the, of the presence? Which it is not lawful. It was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you... 
not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, the, the thing that I want us to look at, and one of the first, the first thing that I want you to, to notice is the thing about the Pharisees is that they are always focused on the letter of the law. The letter of the law of the law, right? And so for them, when they see people walking through a, a field of wheat, right, and picking it, then that's a violation of the law because they're reaping, right? They're like, oh, they're reaping. And then on top of that, they're crushing it in their hands, right? And they're threshing it. And then when they blow it away, they're winnowing it to get rid of the chaff. That's work. And you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. I sit back and I read that and I'm like, how dumb. You know what I mean? Like I read it and I'm like, how, like I wouldn't even be thinking about that, right? I see some dudes walking through grabbing some weed. I'm like, I'm going to try it. You know, I don't think about the, the you know, the, the, but I'm also not trying to control people by controlling the law. The Pharisees are. So they're hyper-focused on the letter of the law, to reap, to thresh, and to winnow. Those are works, and they're doing it, doing it on the Sabbath. It's not lawful. Why were they so intent on focusing and hyper-focusing on the letter of the law? Because if you control the rules of God, you control the people of God. Let me say that again. Because there are a lot of people that attempt to do this. And that is that if you control the rules of God, then you control the people of God. Right? How many of you watch sports? Some of you. I do. Right? In sports, there are people that are, that are literally in the game and they're designed for one reason, and that is to control the game. And when they exhibit too much control, they control things like the outcome of the game and then everybody gets mad. What are they called? Referees, right? Referees control the game. Whoever the referee is gets to interpret the rules. If you interpret the rules, then you control the game. You control the players. That's who the Pharisees want to be. They want to be the people that are in control of the Word of God because they want to control the people of God. Amen? Now, that listen, I, when I, I'm telling you, when we read this, it's real easy, and we often do it, and I do it, and I'm really guilty of it. It's really easy for us to read this and say, look at those evil, wicked Pharisees. Right? But you know, Baptists have been doing the same thing for a long time in a bunch of areas. Right? I mean, some of you are uncomfortable, like, do I say amen? Like, what, what's he talking about? Oh, all kinds of things. We had to issue apologies about slavery. Did you guys know that? Southern Baptists particularly. We had to issue ap apologies for our position on race. There were people who legitimately in the South were using the Word of God to control people by saying that it's okay to own slaves. Right? You're like, I don't know if he's right. Look it up! It's right! Right? They wanted to control the people of God. They, didn't want to hold, they, they wanted to hold on to it, uh, that control because it made them feel empowered. Right? If I control the Word of God, then I must be next to God. Right? I had some Mormons come over to the house one time. Some of you are like, ugh, here we go. I love them. Amen? I love them. And they come to the house. And I was asking them a question. And the question was very simple. How do I get saved? You know what I mean? Like, that's one thing we have to agree on. If you, I don't care what your religion is. If, if you believe in Christ at all, then you have to believe that I'm a sinner condemned to hell without Christ. 
So what I'm asking you is how do I get saved from that condemnation? And they said, you know, basically, that I had to submit to Mormonism. I had to go to a temple and get baptized, right? And then after I went to the temple and got baptized, then they would lay their hands on me and transmit to me the Holy Spirit. I was like, interesting. Let me ask you about that. They said that they had to lay their hands on me to transmit to me the Holy Spirit, and they believe in free agency, free will. So I said, hypothetically speaking, couldn't you use your free agency to deny me the Holy Spirit? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, let's just say I went to the temple, and you're the one who has to lay your hands on me. Couldn't you say, I don't like that guy. I'm not laying hands on him. Well, that would never happen. I know it would never happen, but I'm just saying, hypothetically, couldn't it happen? And eventually they had to say, well, yeah. So you mean to me, you mean to tell me that you can deny me the Holy Spirit because of your free agency. What you're telling me is that you control God. And if you control God, then I need to take the cross down, put your picture up. You know what I mean? Why? Why well, have that control? Because it makes me feel powerful. Because then I can, get th- I can get you to do things for me. I can get money from you. I can do all kinds of things. All you have to do is control the rules. Right? And that we've, we've done that so many times. I used slavery as an example earlier, but there's other things too. There's other things too. There's been controversies throughout the generations when it comes to the Baptist church. And you're like, well, I wasn't Baptist then. You are now. Own it, right? They've repented for a lot of it. You know what I mean? We've repented of a lot of it. Praise God. Because you know what that brings? Forgiveness. Amen? Right? But if you control the rules, you control the game. And that's what the Pharisees wanted to do. So Jesus, think about this for a second. I'm making this one of the points because I think sometimes we, we just skip over it because it's just a given. It's a, it's a granted. Jesus took the time to refute the legalism of the Pharisees intentionally. You know what I mean? What he could have done when they asked him those questions, just, ah, keep on going. You know what I mean? Talk to his disciples later about it or something like that, right? But he didn't. He took time to stop and refute them, to explain to them why they're wrong. And I'm thankful that Jesus, our Lord, took time to stop and show the Pharisees the error of their ways and how they are not controlling God. And this is what it is, See, the three-point argument. The first point that he, that he gives in verses 3 and 4, he says this. He says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are eating on the Sabbath. What, what is not, uh, or your, your, look at what your disciples are doing on the Sabbath, what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Yeah, some version of that. <laughs> Let me just stop and slow down for just a second. My brain's going faster than my mouth. Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. See, it's so much better when I just read. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Have you not read that? The very first thing that he says is David ate consecrated bread, right? One of the things the Pharisees is not going to say is, yeah, well, he's a wicked dude. You know what I mean? They're not going to dismiss David. You can't dismiss David if you're a Pharisee. Why? Because that's like, you know, the dude. You know, besides Moses, he's like the dude, right? So you can't discredit him. Well, he ate bread that was, that was consecrated to God that was, that was only for the priests to eat. As a matter of fact, that story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And David is running for his life from Saul. He's fleeing from Saul. He finds himself in one of the best Old Testament named cities or places that you'll ever read. And I'm going to tell you why it's one of the best. It's easy to pronounce. A place called Nob. N-O-B. That's easy, amen? I love places like Nob and Ur, you know, things like that. 
because there's a whole lot of them that I can't even, I make an attempt, but it's terrible, right? And don't act, don't act like you're all higher than me. You can't pronounce it either. Amen? So he goes to this place called Nob. There's a priest there by the name of Ahimelech. And Ahimelech's there, and, he, and David goes in. He's like, listen, I'm running for my life. Paul, Saul's accusing me of some things that I didn't do, and I'm running. I need five loaves of bread. And the priest is like, well, we ain't got any. The only bread that we have is the bread of the presence, which is there. And then that's replaced, like that's offered as a sacrifice like to the Lord. And then it's replaced daily and then given to the priest. When the warm bread's put out, then the priest gets to eat the, the, the bread that was there from the previous day, right? So that's, he's like, that's the only bread we have here. It's consecrated for the priest. They, you know, it's, it's not for you. That's what it's there for. But him like didn't, he's like, just take it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So David took it and he ate it. Now, if God, if God was, was all about, you know, being uh, the letter of the law kind of a God in this moment, wouldn't he have placed guilt upon David's head? Wouldn't he have done that? But he didn't. He didn't. David came to the conclusion that it's better to live than to observe these technicalities. You know what I mean? This technicality in particular. Right? It's better to live than to do that. So Jesus uses that as his first argument. He's like, look, did did you not know that David ate bread that he wasn't supposed to eat? The second argument... He says in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? In Numbers chapter 28, verses 9 and 10, it tells us that some of the duties that the priests have to do on the Sabbath day. For instance, on the Sabbath day, sacrifices have to be made. Well, who kills them? The priest. And it has to be done in a particular way. And it has to be offered in a particular way. You know, and who does all this stuff? The priests. Amen? On Sundays, all the stuff that, you know, that I do. When people are like, oh, you don't really take Sabbath. Yes, I do. I'm guiltless for violating the Sabbath. For the same reason, the priests are, are not violating the law when they offer sacrifice. Amen? So there's your answer to your question. But anyway, he says, listen. If they're working on the Sabbath because they're preparing the sacrifice and they're doing all that and they're guiltless, then why are you worried about these fellows that are just filling their bellies? You know what I mean? Why do you worry about that? They're not condemned. They're not considered to be violating the Sabbath. They're not guilty before the law. The third thing, to me, is the greatest point of the argument. And that is what he says in verse 6 through 8. I will tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here, amen? The Son of God, right? The Son of God surely greater than the temple, right? What was the temple? The temple was the place where God's presence would come to dwell with man. Jesus is the, the God that came to dwell with man. Right? No temple, no, no obstructions. Like you're standing there and you're talking to him, Pharisees. He's there. He's greater than the temple. And he's there. And he's in your presence. He is with you. Amen? I love that. And he says, and if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now, that, that, he's quoting something there, and you can see that it's in quotations, and that is Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. And what it tells us is that God desires mercy over sacrifice. Well, mercy over, that seems like it's plain as the nose on your face, doesn't it? Right? Mercy. It is merciful for, to let a hungry man eat. That's merciful, amen? It is merciful to let a hungry man eat. What does God desire? Does God desire on the Sabbath for you to starve? No. He doesn't, amen? He desires for you to eat, to be filled. Amen? 
Now, if circumstances have not allowed you to prepare for that, then you're not allowed to put something together. You're not allowed to make yourself a sandwich? No, you're allowed. I mean, these Pharisees, they took stuff over the top. Like, you weren't allowed to drag a chair across a dirt floor on the Sabbath because you're making irrigation. You know what I mean? Crazy stuff. There's this whole, there's this whole like, I don't want to say underground because it's not really underground, but there's like a secondary economy in Israel. And that secondary economy, you have these people that are innovators and stuff. And, and what they're innovating and what they're doing is like, like, I didn't know this, but apparently it's not kosher to push an electrical button on a vending machine and for that electric to be sent to the machine and then allow you to vend the food so that you can eat it. But it is as long as it's hydraulic. So they got hydraulic vending machines in Israel. It's work for an elevator, right, to be electric. It's not for it to be hydraulic. Where is that? You know what I mean? Like, are you serious? Like, we're getting into that kind of thing? The Pharisees are. They got these crazy things. But listen. Listen. God cares about people. Amen? He loves people. And there are, there's even examples of it in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Let's just turn there. I'll tell you what page it is as soon as I find it. I want to read something to you. Deuteronomy chapter 23 is page 183. It's actually going to be page 184 because we're going to start in verse 24. Verses 24 and 25. This is what it says. Listen. If you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish. But you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Now, when we read that, when we're going through the book of Deuteronomy, usually we, when we get to that part, you know, sections like that, we're like, okay, another rule, let's go. Turn the page. Don't look over it. Think about what God's saying. Think about it. You go into your neighbor's field, right? Right? And you're hungry. God doesn't consider it theft. He doesn't consider it stealing for you to eat from that field. It's a violation when you start filling up your bags. Amen? You guys see what I'm saying? In other words, what does God value? Does he value the handful of grapes more or the person's belly? He values the person. Amen? Amen? He says, if you go into the standing grain, that's your neighbor's standing grain. It's not your standing grain, but God says it's okay. God says it's okay to stand there and pick the ears with your hand and eat. What you're not allowed to do is get your sickle out and start chopping it down. Amen? That's a violation. Right? In other words, it's about the person's heart. It's about, listen, so if you own the field, Right? Think about this from this perspective. If you own the field, if you're the one that has the stuff, amen, and somebody's out in your field and they're eating of your grapes, praise God for your ability to help others. Amen? Be thankful for your ability to help others. If they get their bag out, get your gun. <laughs> I'm just joking. Like, don't be taking me literally like, well, Josh said I can shoot them if they come in my field. No. Think about the other side of it, though. If you're the person who's hungry and you're going in, right, don't be greedy. Amen? So many times, like, we, we, do all, we do stuff all the time, right, where we give out stuff to people, and there'll be some people that just come in and they just get all they can, way more than they need. They'll be gathering arms full, you know, just taking all that they can, and while others are doing without. That's greed. Your heart shouldn't be like that. If somebody's allowing you to have a few grapes in their field to get to stave off the hunger, don't get your bag out. If they're allowing you to pick some ears from their wheat field, don't get out your sickle. You see what I mean? 
But this is a prime example of what Jesus is saying in this passage. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. He, 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 the, the thing that he wants is for you to love people like he does. Amen? Point number three. And honestly, this is my last one, so we might get out here a little bit earlier today. I love saying that because people that are come here often are like, hmm, we'll see. Listen, the third point is that legalism takes away your ability to, pre- to appreciate the miracles of a loving God. Listen, legalism will rob you of your ability to see and appreciate what God's doing. Let me say that again because it's a great spot for an amen. Legalism will rob you of your ability to see and appreciate what God is doing. Here's the example. Verse 9. He went on from there. Now think about that. Like this is right after that. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. Of course he did. It's the Sabbath and it's Jesus. Amen? And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And think of the heart that would ask that. You know what I mean? Like, should we not, you think we should just let people die on Sundays? Close the hospitals up. We can't have nurses working floors. You know, I mean, what kind of, uh, come on. They asked him that so that they might accuse him. Verse 11, he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So was it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Then he said to them, to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Can you imagine First of all, it could be the case. I'm not saying it is, but it could be the case that this is the, the Pharisees planted this dude in the crowd. You know what I mean? Or maybe they knew about it and brought him to him. But they're, you can see that it's a setup, right? It has all the feelings of a setup. They're trying to set Jesus up. And they bring this, the, the, this man's there, and they have the audacity to say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Look at their nozzles. Jesus is like, if you got a sheep and it falls in a pit, you going to pull that thing out? Are you going to be merciful to the sheep? Right? What did he just tell him? What does he desire? Mercy over sacrifice, right? Would it, so then would you be merciful to the sheep? Would you pull it out? Would you let it stay there in pain and suffer for the whole Sabbath? While you sit there and listen to its bleeding and its moaning and its cries, would you do that? No, no, not one of you would if that was your sheep. You'd grab it and you'd pull it out of the pit, amen? And if you're willing to be that merciful to a sheep, then how much more valuable is a man? Even on the Sabbath, men are more valuable than sheep. Amen. Right? It's a cool shirt, I just noticed it. It says, best dad. I love that. You are a good dad. But here's the thing, I mean... Literally think about the heart of the people that are talking right there, right? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You mean to tell me that you want to, to this man to have another minute, uh, just another minute with this withered hand when the healer is standing in front of him? You want the healer to keep his mouth shut. Don't touch him. Let him stay in that pit with that withered hand for even an- another second. That's evil. That's wicked. So Jesus says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? You know what I mean? 
And then obviously he tells him, he doesn't, like at that point, he's like, I'm, I'm done with the conversations. Pull out your hand, bro. Not, I don't know, he didn't say bro. Right? He, hand comes out and it's completely restored. And I'm telling you at this moment, the Pharisees should have grown in their faith. They should have dropped everything they were doing and followed Jesus because he just healed that man's hand. In front of them, they saw it, and they're so stuck on the rules that they can't even appreciate what God's doing. You know what I mean? I pray to God that we are never a church that is so stuck on the rules that we can't appreciate God's moving. I pray that we never are. And I've been to those churches. I've been in them. I felt really uncomfortable in them for the majority of my life. Well, I've been here a long time now, so I don't know if it's a majority yet. I'll have to do the math later. But for a long time, I grew up in those kind of churches where somebody would walk in. You'd have like a mom with like three kids, a single mom with three kids doing everything that she could just to get the kids in the door. Yeah, their hair was messed up. Yeah, her clothes weren't probably appropriate. You know, all this kind of stuff. And they would sit back and they'd, you know, act like she didn't have the, she wasn't allowed to talk to them. I've been at churches where they had separate ministries for the bus ministries because they didn't want to mix those bad kids with their good kids. What do you think Jesus would want? You know what I mean? Are we, so, are we going to be so legalistic and worry about what people are wearing that we miss the fact that they made it to church? I pray that that's never us. I don't think it is. As a matter of fact, when I talk to people and they're like, why well, should I wear to church on Sunday? I was like, just come. As long as it's covered up, I don't care. <laughs> you know? And if you can't cover it up, we'll give you something. We got free T-shirts, amen? <laughs> I'll give you a free T-shirt. <laughs> well, somebody next week will come in with hardly nothing on just so they can get a free T-shirt. <laughs> don't do that. Just tell me you want one. We'll figure it out. We don't ever want to be so intent on the letter of the law that we miss the intent of the law. Why is the law given? To show us we need Jesus. Amen? So when Jesus is there, right, my focus can go from the law to the relationship with him. Right? Right? I don't have to worry about the rules. What i got to worry about is the relationship. And I, this is what I know about God, and this is what he's shown me over the years. The closer I walk with him, the easier it is to, to automatically live up to the law. It like goes hand in hand, right? We, we, we do right things because of our relationship with him. We don't do right things in order to have a relationship with him. That's not how it works. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. Not even you. Amen? It's his righteousness. That's what matters. That's the reason why when these Pharisees come around and they're all acting all self-righteous, what are they saying? What they're saying is, we control the rules, so we follow the rules. Right? Well, if you control the rules, it's real easy to follow them. Amen? Because you can make exceptions. I guarantee you right now, if one of those Pharisees had a sheep and it fell in the pit and other Pharisees were standing around talking about how you shouldn't pull the thing out of the pit and he already did, then he'd be telling them why he had to pull the thing out of the pit. Justifying it, amen? Because it's easy to follow the rules when you control the rules. Right? You can make the violations into justifications. But instead of, instead of just... Looking at what just happened in front of them, this man with a withered hand is made whole in Christ. Instead of focusing on that, what do they do? They get together and plot to kill him. Why? Because he's a danger to their establishment. Amen? He's a danger to their control. He's a danger to their grip on the people of God. Jesus loves people more than he does 
with technicalities. Amen? Jesus loves people more than your rules. Jesus loves people more than Baptist legalism. Hey, listen, we ain't the only ones. Pentecostals got their own legalism, right? But it don't make it right. If we all have it, it don't make it right. Jesus loves people more than that. How do I know? Because he desires mercy more than sacrifice. He said it himself, amen? So listen, sometimes when you see things, and I'm not talking about violations of morality, and neither is Jesus, right? He's not talking about things like, uh, well, you know, I care about people more than I do about the law, so, you know, you all can have adultery and stuff, you know, whatever. He's not saying that, amen? He's not saying, you know, he's not talking about the moral stuff here. He's talking about the ceremonial stuff, the, the, the marking, the checking the boxes, you know? Like checking the boxes stuff. Jesus cares way more about people. So when you see people and you got these boxes that you think need to be checked and you, they're calling themselves Christians, but they're not doing it just like you. They're not doing it just right. Maybe they just got started. Maybe they're not dressing right. Maybe they're not speaking the Christianese. Maybe they're not, you know, fixing their hair the way that Baptist women do. And did you know that there's like periods of time where different, different hairstyles identify with Baptists? Like there's times in history where you can go back and you can tell what religion a person is just by their hairdo. And I ain't talking about like back in the old Middle Ages. I'm talking about there's a certain hairstyle for the 1990s, for the 1980s, for the 1970s. You can identify. You know exactly who who goes to church and who don't. You're like, well, it's pretty diverse now. (laughs) Call this diversity? Well, if somebody walked in and had some big, tall, huge mohawk or something like that, you're going to, you know, not sit in their pew? What if they had a big leather jacket, tattoos all over the place? I know most of y'all, because this is Penrill, you'd be like, that's one of Josh's buddies. You know? <laughs> right? So, I mean, we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, you know, here very much. And I'm thankful for that. But what if they don't mark your boxes? I don't know what your boxes are. You know what they are between you and God. You know. You're going to value the person or your boxes? Because what Jesus wants is the person. That's what he wants. Amen? Jesus loves people more than your rules. Man, I'm thankful for that too. One of the reasons I'm thankful for that is because there's a a universal law that is is true from the foundations of the earth, and that is that the wages of sin is death. Amen? I mean, sin is disobedience to life, right? God is life. Disobedience to life, so you're going away from it. You're choosing death. Like literally the wages of sin is death. It's a universal law. But man, he loves people more than he loves that law. Amen? So he gave his life to pay for the sin of the world. He took that wage, that penalty on himself for us. That's how much he loves people. That's how much he loves you. Amen? And I'm thankful for that. That he said, all right. There's that universal law. So I'm going to make a way for them to get to me anyway. I'm thankful for that. But the question is, who, who are you in this story? Who do you identify with in this story? And that, you know, first of all, I know nobody says, oh, I'm just like the Pharisees. That's who I identify with. Matter of fact, I'm going to get a shirt made. You know, number one Pharisee. <laughs> Maybe I should, you know, people at least ask questions, you know. But here, are, are you the, the hungry follower of Jesus, just trying to get your belly full? I identify with that a lot, amen? I identify with that a lot. Sometimes I mess up in some people's eyes. That's the reason why it's hard for me. I don't like going to these conventions and all this stuff. I don't fit in with those folks, right? I'm just, so a lot of times I feel like I'm just the disciples over trying to get a, better, a handful of grain while they're on the sidelines looking at me saying, ooh, really? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel. And it's a pride thing, and I shouldn't even be like that, right? <laughs> Sometimes that's how I feel. You identify with the one who's 
trying to be like Jesus? The one who's just trying to show mercy, no matter what the rules are, just trying to show mercy, trying to show love, trying to help people. I pray that that's who. But sometimes I identify with a man with a withered hand, amen? Some of you guys might feel that way too, it's, but it's not a withered hand that you're here with, but you're here with a withered heart that's withered from sin. The good news is he's willing to heal you even today, even on the Sabbath. Amen? If you submit your life to him, give him your life. Accept his penalty. Accept his payment for the penalty of your sin. Give him your whole life. He's worthy of it because he's done so much, because he's so great. Amen? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Or are you attempting to be God's gatekeeper by controlling the rules? If that's you, listen, it's time to take the shackles off. It's time for you to see what God's doing and appreciate what God's doing in the lives of those who are around you. I was interviewed yesterday by a young man who was doing an interview for college, and he called me, and one of the things that he asked me, he said, uh, well, what's, your, what's your, your, your marker for you know, how, how well things are going? Is it how many people there's in your congregation? I said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, that's not my marker at all. And he was kind of taken aback by it. He's like, so you don't think that if you got more people, you're doing better? I said, not always, because you could just be doing something popular. You know what I mean? As a matter of fact, if that's the standard, the Cincinnati Reds are way better at it than we are. Sometimes, sometimes we have a bigger congregation than they do. You know, but they're good now. I was use the Reds because they're good right now. Right? Sports teams are better than that. If that's the marker, butts in the seats, then sports teams are better than we are. Amen? I said, that's not the marker. The marker for me is when people step out in faith, when they do the next thing, whatever it is. For somebody that's just given their life to Christ, the next thing is baptism. You know what I mean? And so when they step out and, and, bapt- and get baptized, that to me is a mark of success in the body of Christ. When we take communion and we honor God and we come together as people who believe and we, and we, we just stop in that moment to remember his sacrifice and what he did for us. That, to me, is a marker of growth when there's, you know, people doing that. To me, it's when somebody comes into my office and they say, listen, I'm a marginal Christian, but I want to take a step in faith. I want to lead a Bible study. I want to do this. I want to do whatever. I want to just do what God's telling me to do. That, to me, is a mark of growth. When the Pharisees stop, look, you know, get the shackles off and start seeing for real what God has done in the congregation of Penarol Baptist Church, by every metric of God, we're doing good. Amen? But that don't mean we sit back and we say, oh, we're doing good. We're doing good. No. Just because we're doing good doesn't mean we can't be better. Amen? See, Jesus loves people more than he does rules. Instead of us, you know, marking off the boxes, coming to church and making sure we sing this amount of songs and I got five points for my sermon and all that kind of stuff, what if we focus instead on something like this? So-and-so's going through a rough time. I need to call them. Just tell them I love them. See if there's anything I can do for them. You know what I mean? People get bent out of shape when the pastor doesn't do that, but there's a lot of y'all. Amen? We are all called to it. Right? I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep doing all that kind of stuff. I'm going to mark those boxes. Right? But what about the people? We got people in the hospital right now. You're like, but I don't know them. But they're part of your congregation. Amen? Give them a call. Go see them. Let them know you're praying for them. Will it be awkward? Absolutely. Right? If you don't know somebody and you walk into a hospital room, hey, I'm from the church. We haven't really met. I've seen you there, but I just came to pray with you. The awkwardness goes away like that when you just bring God into it. Amen? Be there for one another. Have mercy on one another. Right? Care for one another. And if somebody comes in that door, that's ne- that, that has never darkened the doors before. Show them mercy. Show them love. Show them kindness. If they got a withered hand, tell them stretch it out. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, what else are we doing here? Right? It's about the relationship. It's about us introducing people to Jesus. Taking them with, to the one who, who can heal them. Right? And taking care of their needs in the process. 
Jesus summed all that up later on. He said, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with everything that's in you and love your neighbor. Amen? Simple stuff. If it's so simple, then we should be great at it. Let's do better. Amen? Let's do better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for your word. And I know that, you know, sometimes things get jumbled up, but... uh, you, you, you chose to deliver it through me, so I pray, Lord, that you clarify it in people's hearts, that, the, that what you once said would be the thing that rings true today. Lord, the bottom line is all of us have fallen into that, you know, pharisaical mindset from time to time where we think that people should act like and, and be like X, Y, Z, and whatever. Lord, I just pray that in the times when folks don't, we show them mercy. That we, get, we don't get so wrapped up in crossing T's and dotting I's that we forget the letter, the love letter that you've written to us. Lord, I pray that as good as this church is, and I'm thankful for it, I'm thankful for it, I'm thankful for how loving our people are and how I don't have any reservations with telling somebody, just come. Because I know that the people that are in this group, we we won't judge them by what they're wearing or how they act while they're here or anything like that. We're not a judgmental people. But that's because of you, because of what you've done in the hearts of those who are here. So I give you praise for that, and I thank you for that. But, Lord, I also pray that we never, you know, we, we don't ever become like that. It's so easy to because of pride, because we feel like we're the closest ones to you, you know, that kind of thing, Lord. It's real easy for us to give in to the temptation that comes along with that pride. So, Lord, I pray that you would keep us from it. And that, Lord, when those things, you know, show up, that you would expose it for us so that we could repent of it, so that there would be forgiveness and that we would grow in you. And, Lord, most of all, I pray that we would love each other better, that we would show each other mercy better. From the top to the bottom, from the kids to the adults, Lord, I pray that we would love one another and love you better. Help us to do that. And for those who are here, Lord, and maybe their their heart is withered with the stain of sin, they haven't given their life to you and trusted you for the payment of their sin, Lord, I pray that they would come to you now, bow before you, confess their sin to you, Lord, repent of that sin, walk away, never pick it up again, and live their lives for you. Because you are the source of salvation. You are the source of life and the source of mercy. So we thank you for that, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and sing. Open up the skies of mercy. Rain down.
Rise round us, and hear our cry. 